Hi kids, welcome to I Love Big Trains number three. I'm Jeff. And I'm Kevin. We have a great show for you. We'll take a ride on the last operating interurban in the United States, the South Shore. We'll visit famous steam locomotive expert and mechanic Doyle McCormick and see how a band of volunteers restored one of the most beautiful steam locomotives in the world. Then we'll head north to Alaska where the best way to see the gorgeous scenery is from a train. Plus a lot more. As always, we open with a song. Welcome to the South Shore Line, the only remaining interurban passenger rail service in the United States. The South Shore Line has been operating between Chicago and South Bend since 1903. Thousands of people ride these trains from their homes in Indiana to their jobs in Chicago. Let's talk about how the South Shore Line has powered. For many years, locomotives have been propelled by electric motors. Most of these locomotives use diesel-powered motors to turn the generators that create electricity for the electric traction motors. These locomotives are called, appropriately, diesel-electric locomotives. But the South Shore is different. Their locomotives, or motor cars, don't use diesel motors to generate the electricity. They get their power from overhead electrified cables. This is known as a catenary system. The electric power needed to run the trains is transferred from the cable to the train through pantographs. A few years ago, the South Shore Passenger Service was in danger of being discontinued. But thanks to the Indiana State Legislature, the South Shore Line was saved. Those folks realized how important rail service to Chicago was to their state. So they took over the South Shore Line and renamed it the Northern Indiana Commuter Transportation District. But most people still call it the South Shore Line. Leave it to the politicians to make things complicated. As we showed you in part two, the South Shore Line is also used for freight service. But passenger trains always have the right of way. Every morning at the Carroll Street Station in Michigan City, the 840 train adds more cars. Here's how the cars are added. After the train is at the station, another train pulls up behind it from a siding. Below each coupler is a bank of pin connectors that conduct power between the cars for things like the intercom and pantograph. Before the cars are added on, 
the brakeman wipes the connectors to ensure a perfect electrical connection. Next, the trains are coupled together. Then the pantographs are dropped and the power is shut off. But not for long. Almost immediately, the pantographs are raised again and power is restored. Now the train is ready to load passengers for the 60 mile journey to Chicago. After the passengers get settled in, the conductor pushes a button, which signals the motorman, or engineer, it's okay to pull out of the station. The motorman sits in the lead car and runs the train. He rings the bell and blows the horn at crossings. Adjust the throttle to change the speed of the train and applies the brakes to make the train stop. This is the station at Beverly Shores. I love that old neon sign. It looks great at night. At all the stations, care is taken to make sure everyone travels safely. The walkway nearest the tracks has a bright yellow rubber tread so passengers don't slip in the rain or snow. Signs are posted warning passengers to stay behind the yellow line while the train is in motion. The steps for boarding and leaving the train have deep treads and there are also handrails for passengers to grab. Spotlights illuminate the steps and ground so people can see where they're stepping at night. The South Shore runs on a single track main line for most of its journey. Block signals play a very important safety role. They make sure that only one train occupies the track. On the way to Chicago, the South Shore passes small towns, fields, industrial areas, and neighborhoods. Chicago is one of the busiest railroad centers in the world. Trains come and go from all over the country. Chicago also has the L, which takes people all around the city. It is called the L because it runs on elevated trestles. The L trains get their power from an outside third rail that runs alongside the two main rails. The two inner rails prevent the train from falling off the tracks in case of derailment. Downtown Chicago is called the Loop because the L tracks form a loop around the main downtown area. The loop route runs along Wabash Avenue, to Lake Street, to Wells Street, to Van Buren Street. This forms a loop around downtown Chicago. Passenger and freight trains share the same track between South Bend, Indiana and Chicago. If you're driving from Chicago to Indiana, ask your parents to take Route 12 because Route 12 runs parallel with the South Shore tracks and you can see lots of train action. If you love trains, you probably wish you lived on this street in Michigan City, Indiana. This is 11th Street, and it has three lanes, 
two for cars and one for trains. Everybody, both freight and passenger trains, run right down the middle of the street. Like the cars, the trains have to stop at a red light. When the light turns green, both the cars and the trains proceed on their merry way. Of course, you've seen crossing gates block cars from crossing the tracks when a train is coming. But I bet you've never seen a gate block another train. Very interesting. Here's another interesting railroad scene. You know a train runs on two rails. And we've seen how certain trains use three rails. But what's this? Four rails. This is a special track bed used near elevated passenger platforms. The passenger trains need to be very close to the platform. So there is no large gap for the passengers to step over. But those tracks are too close for a freight train locomotive and freight cars because they are wider than the passenger cars on the South Shoreline. So the track splits into two routes. The freight train uses the first and the third rail, while the passenger train uses the second and the fourth rail. trains help the community and the environment. Taking the train means less cars on the road. Less cars means less pollution. And that is a good thing. And if you love trains, getting to ride on one is a great way to start the day. to watch steam engines. There's just so much going on. Big drivers turning, smoke belching from the stack, whistle blowing, bell ringing, drive rods churning, steam hissing. And when you stand close to a passing steam locomotive, I swear the earth shakes. Doyle McCormick is an expert on steam locomotives. He has been working on them since 1968 and has brought back to life many old steamers that had two drivers in the scrap heap grave. Among Doyle's many salvage jobs is my favorite engine, the Southern Pacific's 4449 Daylight. In 1975, Doyle supervised its restoration and conversion to the red, white, and blue locomotive that headed the American Freedom Train. Doyle was also an engineer on the American Freedom Train. We caught up with Doyle in the engine house at Brooklyn Yards in Portland, Oregon. Doyle, when did your fascination with steam locomotives begin? My dad worked on the railroad and as a kid, you know, I liked to go with him to work. And uh, the steam engines went out in 1958, where we came from. I was 15 years old, so I remember them quite well. And my dad working on the railroad, I had the opportunity to ride some steam engines and that's, you know, all I ever wanted to be was an engineer when I was a kid and I grew up on an engineer now. But... Is running a steam engine fun? I like running a steam engine. I wouldn't want to do it as a full-time job. It's a lot of work. It's hard work. If I just had to run the engine and somebody else had to take care of it, that would be great. 
But when you have to run it and you have to take care of it too, then it gets to be a real chore. Why do so many people like steam engines? What's the appeal? That's a good question. You know, why do you like trains? Uh, the steam engines are one of the things that helped make America as great as it is today was our ability to transport goods from either the mines or the fields to transport the raw material to the manufacturing base and then deliver the manufactured products to the people. It was our transportation network from the 1860s clear up to today that has made this country you know, as successful as it has been in the economic world was our ability to move goods and raw materials. And these, these locomotives were what helped develop our transportation network into what it is today. These were the giants in their day. This represents a flashback to that era. When people see this, the people that remember them, it brings back you know, memories to them. There's a whole generation out there that has never seen one of these. They don't understand what these represent to America and, and what made it so great. And for them, it's something new and exciting. For the older generation, it's something that unique out of their past. And for those of us crazies that just like to run them, you know. Wow, I never knew trains played such an important part in the history of America. How do steam engines work? Like this whole thing is like a big barrel. And it's full of water. And all those tubes come from an area in the back that looks very similar to this that's open. And you build a fire in the back and all the hot gas and smoke comes up through those tubes. And the water completely surrounds the tubes. And it boils that water. And it turns into steam and of course steam rises. These two big pipes that come off of here, the throttle is mounted up in the top. When you open the throttle, it lets that steam come down through these pipes into the valves here which move back and forth and admit and exhaust steam into the pistons and cause the piston to go back and forth, which are connected to the wheels, which makes the whole thing go down the track. I think I understand, but one thing still baffles me. How does a wispy thing like steam have the power to move a giant steam locomotive? You're getting into physics now, and I don't know whether the, your audience understands physics and pressures, but you're dealing with 200 pounds of steam per square inch. And when you look at a thing that's, that's, you know, 20 inches around, just rough math tells me that's 10 inch radius. You square that, that's 100 times 3.17. So you're looking at three, over 300 square inches times 200 pounds of pressure per square inch is 20,000 pounds of push on that piston. 20,000 pounds is a lot of force, a lot of force. And you multiply that times two because you got a piston on each side. So now you got 40,000 pounds of force pushing on the pistons. 40,000 pounds will, will do a lot of, a lot of work. So 40,000 pounds of pressure moves the pistons back and forth. The pistons move the drive rods and the drive rods turn the drivers, which makes the steam engine move down the track. Now I get it. I think. Doyle. Why did steam engines fade away? Steam locomotives are notoriously, one, they're inefficient. A diesel locomotive, on the other hand, is still an inefficient machine, and they still get about 35% efficiency. So right off the bat, the diesel locomotive is, is three times as efficient fuel economy-wise as a steam engine. So they cut their maintenance costs by 10 times, and they cut their fuel costs by three times. Economics dictates everything in this country. What's it like to sit in the cab and drive a steam locomotive? It's hot, yeah. it's dirty, it's noisy, and it's a lot of work. Everything on here is a manual system, and it takes two people. The fireman, his job is to make sure that there's adequate steam pressure, plenty of water in a boiler, etc. The engineer's job is to run the train, which is different than running the engine, because running the engine is the easy part. Running the train is the hard part because you got a mile long freight behind you that's 5,000 tons and you have to be thinking and managing how you're going to handle that 5,000 ton train. Running the engine is like driving a car after a while. It becomes second nature to you. It takes a while to 
to be able to interpret all the sounds and the feel and the vibration and know what the machine is doing and be able to communicate with it. But after a while, you know, people ride on it and, and I can hear things on the engine that other people can. All they hear is noise and it's loud up there. But each of the little noises have a meaning. And you can sit on the engine and you can listen to it and you can notice the changes in various noises and the way she's, she's moving and riding and, and you make your adjustments with the throttle and the reverser accordingly. And uh, that, that makes a difference between an engineer and a motorman. So. What's the difference between being an engineer on a diesel and being an engineer on a steamer? It's a difference like driving a Model T Ford and driving a new Cadillac with air conditioning. Do steam engines have air conditioning? No, no. We, we say we have two by 60 air conditioning, two windows by 60 miles an hour. And we were down in Yuma, Arizona with this, uh, oh, it's been 10 years ago now. And we went into Yuma, it was 111 degrees outside. And you're sitting in a boiler room there, effectively. And there wasn't anything in that engine you could touch without burning your hands on it. Okay, this is like the gas pedal in your car. This is the throttle. You pull that back, and it delivers steam out of the boiler down through those two pipes to the cylinders out there. The big silver handle here is like the gear shift in your car. That's what they call a reverser. You go that way, you go forward. You go this way, you go backwards. When you start with it all the way down in what they call a corner, that's like low gear. And as the engine accelerates and you go faster and faster, you keep moving it up one notch at a time by listening to the engine. And you can tell by the sound of the exhaust when you need to come up a notch. Just like shifting your gears in your car, you can tell by the sound and the feel of the engine, you shift it. But instead of doing it three or four times here, what do I have, 25 or 30 notches? These other two handles are the two brakes. One is for the engine brakes only, and this is the train and the engine brakes. If you use this one, it puts the brakes on both the train and the engine at the same time. If you use this one, it only puts the brakes on the engine. And then you got the sanders and the air horn and all the other appliances here. Radio, of course, you gotta have communication these days. But all the gauges tell the engineer about the status of the boiler pressure, how much pressure is in the boiler, how much pressure is in the cylinders, now, how much air pressure you have for your brake system. And of course, hidden down in the corner that you can't see is the speedometer. I keep that hidden so I'm the only one that knows how fast we're going. <laughs> Tells you how much water is in the tender. And there's a little auxiliary engine called a booster. And when you use it, that gives you the status of the booster. But this basically is where the engineer runs the engine and the train. Now, on the other side is the fireman's side of the engine. And he takes care of all the water in the boiler and the fuel going into the fire. And I'll have to open the door and let you look in the firebox. It's like a dance hall in there. And we call it the Devil's Playhouse. Because when you're running this thing, the fire in there, the temperatures in that boiler run over 2,000 degrees. So and it, it's really hot in there. And you're producing a lot of power here. How fast can steam engines go? We always say that the speed of this engine is limited by the guts of the engineer. <laughs> Uh, they'll run. Believe me, she'll run. There's a rough rule of thumb in steam engines. One mile an hour for every inch of driver. And this has 80 inch drivers on it. So the optimum speed for this engine is 80 miles an hour. Thanks, Doyle. That was fun. Thanks for taking us back to the days when steam was king. Alaska is our 49th state. It was admitted into the Union on January 3rd, 1959. Eight months later, Hawaii became our 50th state. Alaska, like Hawaii, is not physically attached to the United States mainland. Alaska is our biggest state with 656,000 square miles. Fairbanks and Anchorage are the two largest cities population-wise. The Alaska Railroad has a line that connects the two cities. In between are 363 miles of gorgeous scenery. The best way to see it is to take a train. 
Special excursion trips, such as the one provided by Princess Cruises, offer beautiful views everywhere you look. The train is headed by two locomotives. The lead locomotive is an SD70 Mac, and the trailing locomotive is a GP40-2. Both locomotives were built by General Motors. The special passenger cars make it easy to see the scenery. Special passenger cars have wide vista windows that curve over the side so there isn't a bad seat in the house. On the lower level, there are open platforms so you can enjoy the view and the fresh air. Looking down as you travel across a high bridge over a raging stream gets the adrenaline pumping and provides a fine opportunity for taking pictures. Almost everywhere you look, you see wildlife. Bear, deer, buffalo, and moose are very common. So common, in fact, that after a few days, you just accept them as part of the Alaskan experience. The mountains in stillness create a peaceful setting. The skies are a rich blue and the air is clean and cool. The trip on the train captures this stark beauty and provides the passengers with an unforgettable journey. Alaska has a lot of snow and a lot of Alaskan husky dogs. Huskies are used to pull sleds for transportation and races. The driver of dog sleds is called a musher. Jeff King is the winningest musher in the world. Jeff has won many races, including the most famous dog sled race of them all, the 1,049 mile Iditarod. Let's talk about the Alaskan Huskies. A special carousel teaches the dogs to work together. Some like to take a break and bark at their buddies to go faster. The carousel also allows trainers to evaluate the dogs and see how best to train them and utilize them in a team. Puppies exercise on this wheel the same way hamsters do. Dogs are of racing age between three and seven years old. The dogs learn to obey the musher's commands. Haw means turn left and G means turn right. If you want to read a good book about Alaskan Huskies, I highly recommend Call of the Wild by Jack London. I also like the poems about Alaska, written by Robert Service. My favorite is The Cremation of Sam McGee. The White Pass and Yukon Route operates in Skagway, about 80 miles north of Juneau, Alaska's state capital. This narrow gauge railroad was built in 1898 during the Klondike Gold Rush. The WP and YR was the last commercial narrow gauge railroad in the United States. In 1982, the WP and YR ceased operations. But in 1988, the railroad was back in business as a tourist operation. Gauge refers to the distance between the two rails. The standard distance between the rails in America is four feet, eight and one half inches. Narrow gauge measures three and one half feet between the rails, 14 and one half inches narrower. That's why they call it narrow gauge. 
These Alco Design DL535Es were built in Canada by Alco's subsidiary company, Montreal Locomotive Works. The other diesel locomotives are these General Electric Shovel Nose engines. They're nicknamed Shovel Nose because of the slanted front end that resembles a shovel. The passenger cars are on average 50 years old and have a vintage wooden look. They are named after the rivers and lakes in Alaska, Yukon, and British Columbia. There is Lake Aishahik, Lake Linderman, Lake Marsh, and Lake Portage. The train is very comfortable and fun to ride. The windows are kept clean, so passengers have a clear view of the beautiful passing scenery. When it gets cold, a modern heater provides warmth. Smokestacks from old wood stoves are used to let out the smoke from the new heaters. The trains pick up passengers from the cruise ship docked in the Skagway Harbor. Both trains are loaded quickly as the folks are anxious to begin their 40 mile round trip journey. Along the way, we see an old White Pass steam locomotive and a retired steam-powered rotary snowplow. That big blade in front turns and shoots the snow out the side. I'll bet it moved a lot of snow in its day. The trains make a steady 2,865 foot climb up to the peak of the White Pass Summit, just over the Canadian border. Here, the locomotives switch ends and the trains head back to Skagway. So the passengers get a second chance to see the beauty of Alaska. Alaska has a lot to offer. Beautiful vistas, fascinating wildlife, vast open spaces, the northern lights, and best of all, as far as I'm concerned, exciting train rides. Well, time to go. I have to catch a train. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the show. When I see that big engine coming down the track, I get all excited and that's a fact. There's no denying it, I love big trains. Headed down the line I feel a chill run down my spine There's no denying it I love big trains Big old trucks, why they're okay But I see them on the road almost every day Buses and planes just aren't the same Compared to the side of big old trains Denying it, I love big trains. Safety is the most important thing on a railroad. Real trains are a lot of fun, 
but they can also be very dangerous. It's okay to watch trains from a safe distance, but you never walk on tracks, tamper with signals, or climb on railroad equipment.